Beginning in the mid-19th century, the related media of photography, audio recording, filmmaking, and eventually television worked in concert to bring lifelike images of the president into the homes of the American voting public. Over the course of nearly 200 years, those sounds and images have ranged from the historic to the mundane, but each has done its part in bringing the president closer to the American people. Hi, I'm movie man Eric Houston, and today it's my pleasure to take you on a tour through a selection of some of these sounds and images and to tell you the stories behind them. Of course, none of these technologies existed when George Washington became the first president. Instead, this is without any doubt one of the most famous portraits of George Washington, even though it's unfinished. Known as the Athenaeum, it was painted by Gilbert Stuart in 1796, three years before Washington's death. Gilbert used it as a model for copies that he would sell for about $100 each but its greatest fame undoubtedly came when it became the model for the engraving on the dollar bill. When I think of Washington, this is how I think of him, and I'm sure that's true for many of you. It's also roughly true for the first Americans. Portraits like these were really the only way for many Americans to know what their president looked like throughout the late 17 and early 1800s. That all began to change in the mid-1800s with the invention of photography, for the first time, Americans had access to true-to-life portraits of their leaders. The first president we have a photograph of is John Quincy Adams. He had been president from 1825 to 1829, and then returned to Congress where he had become a staunch opponent of slavery. This photo was taken in 1843, four years before Adams' death. It's unclear if the photo was taken in his home in Massachusetts, or in Washington, D.C., although I think it was probably the latter. It was taken by German-born photographer Philip Haas, who had studied daguerreotype in Paris. Daguerreotype is an early form of photography that involved chemically treating sheets of copper. This form of photography required very long exposure times for the chemicals to work their way into the copper, and as a result, these photographs were easy to blur and hard to take. Adams gave the photo to his ally in Congress, Representative Horace Everett of Virginia, and it resided with Everett's family for generations, until it was only fairly recently rediscovered and sold at auction to the Smithsonian for $360,500. It is also not the only picture of Adams. This photograph was taken during a trip to New York in Niagara Falls on August the 1st, 1843. Adams thought the photo was hideous, and it passed through countless hands and was lost to history until it turned up in an antique store in 1970, priced at just 50 cents. It, too, is in the Smithsonian. While these two photos are of the earliest president photographed, they are not the first photographs of a president. That honor belongs to William Henry Harrison the ninth president of the United States and the shortest serving president in U.S. history, Harrison died of pneumonia or a similar ailment only 31 days after his inauguration. This photo was taken shortly after his inaugural address, taken March the 4th, 1841. It was the first photograph of a sitting president, and it is currently held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Unlike the Adams photos, which were of more of a personal nature, these photographs would have been widely circulated after first being recreated as wood engravings and then published in newspapers, allowing Americans a chance to get a somewhat realistic look at their president. It was an important first step in helping to demystify the presidency, bringing the president, in essence, down from Mount Olympus and helping to make him seem more like a common man. We also have pictures of the two presidents between Adams and Harrison. This photograph of Andrew Jackson was taken at his home, the Hermitage, in 1845. Jackson was 78 years old, and the photo was taken just months before his death. The photo was taken by Matthew Brady for his book, The Gallery of Illustrious Americans. Jackson 
thought the photograph, quote, made him look like a monkey. Brady also took a picture of Martin Van Buren in 1855 or so, and used this one to help promote his New York photography studio. From then on, photographs exist of every man who has served as president, with Abraham Lincoln becoming, perhaps, the first widely photographed president, as the technology became both easier to use and more readily available. This photograph is one of the earliest, and was taken during the Lincoln-Douglas campaign in 1858 by Roderick M. Cole in Peoria, Illinois. Lincoln reportedly said of the portrait, quote, I cannot see why all you artists want a likeness of me, unless it is because I am the homeliest man in the state of Illinois. Nevertheless, Lincoln seems to have liked this portrait, using it on campaign ribbons, signing copies of it for admirers, and even giving a copy to his stepmother. As the 20th century loomed, audio recordings became the newest means by which Americans could better know their president. In 1889, Benjamin Harrison became the first president to have his voice recorded and kept. It was recorded on a wax cylinder by an Edison employee at the Pan American Congress. As president of the United States, I was president of the first Pan American Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, Dr. Bob Peck, our 200 shall continue to live side by side in peace and prosperity. In the 1890s, movies were finally a reality, and Americans were eager to see the images of their president come alive on the screen. William McKinley would be the first president to appear in a movie, at his home in Canton, Ohio in 1896, while campaigning. Filmed by the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company, this is a reenactment of McKinley receiving the news of the presidential nomination. There does not seem to be a similar film of McKinley's Democratic rival, William Jennings Bryan, perhaps because McKinley's brother, Abner, held stock in the film company. Before we proceed, I want to make one quick word. With these earliest films, what we're talking about are silent films, and they would have been accompanied at the time, perhaps by a pianist, an organist, a fiddler, something like that. I have added music to these films to make them just a little bit more watchable. McKinley again appears on film at his inauguration, this time in a film made by the Edison Company. Here, you can also see outgoing President Grover Cleveland on the right. William McKinley was the 25th President of the United States, and he served from 1897 to 1901. He was Commander-in-Chief during the Spanish-American War and was the last President who had served in the American Civil War. But probably the most momentous moment of his presidency occurred on September the 6th, 1901, just six months into McKinley's second term. McKinley was speaking at the Pan American Exhibition, a World's Fair held in Buffalo, New York. Edison's men were on hand making several films of the fair, including this panoramic view of the electric tower, one of the central structures of the fair, which was taken by tying a camera to a balloon. The films also included this view of the fair at night, which showed off how Edison's team lit the fair at night with electric lights. Quite the boon for 1901. Edison's men also filmed McKinley speaking at the exposition. On that day, the 6th, McKinley was shaking hands with the public at the Temple of Music. McKinley loved meeting the public like this, and there were huge lines to meet him. Amongst the crowd was a man named Leon Sholgash, an anarchist, who viewed McKinley as an oppressor. When Sholgash stepped forward to shake the president's hand, he instead took out a gun and shot the president twice. Edison's men were on hand to film the crowd afterward. This is the description of the film from the Edison catalog. On Friday, September 6, 1901, we had our cameras in position to photograph the president as he left the Temple of Music. But the deplorable assassination, of course, prevented our getting this picture. 
We did, however, secure an excellent panoramic view of the mob, surging in front of the Temple of Music, attempting to get at the assassin. These pictures have created intense excitement and interest. This picture was photographed immediately after the shooting and shows the intense excitement of the people. The Pan-American Exposition Guards are plainly seen in the background, trying to check the frantic multitude as they sway backward and forward in their mad endeavor to reach the assassin. McKinley didn't die that day, but lingered until September 14th. Following Lincoln and Garfield, McKinley was the third president to have been assassinated in less than 40 years. The public was heartbroken, and the Edison Company commissioned several commemorative films following his death. There were films of the funeral cortege in Buffalo, New York, and Washington, D.C., as well as the arrival of his body in his hometown of Canton, and of the procession entering West Lawn Cemetery, where McKinley was to be interred. There was also a special film commemorating McKinley alongside Lincoln and Garfield called The Martyred Presidents. It also featured a man pleading with the spirit of Columbia for justice. The most gruesome of these films by far was entitled The Execution of Sholgosh with Panorama of Auburn Prison. This film features a reenactment of Sholgosh's execution in the electric chair that was advertised as the real thing. A brief warning, while what you are seeing is a reenactment, it may nevertheless be disturbing. McKinley was succeeded by his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, who would go on to become the first widely filmed president. Roosevelt was very photogenic and very cooperative with cameramen, often pausing during speeches to turn and wave at them. He began appearing in films, though, long before becoming president, mainly during the Spanish-American War alongside his Rough Riders. He was also already being parodied for his larger-than-life outdoorsman persona as early as 1901 with this film, Terrible Teddy the Grizzly King, from the Edison Company and influential film pioneer Edwin S. Porter. The other gentlemen on screen are meant to be reporters, suggesting that Roosevelt's outdoorsman persona was all an act. <laughs> Roosevelt's presidency coincided with the expansion of film's popularity and improvements in the technology, allowing more public events to be filmed 
than ever before, and the activities of the president were a particularly popular subject. Roosevelt was filmed at his 1905 inauguration, crossing the field at an Army-Navy football game, and during his visit to Panama, the first time a sitting president visited a foreign country. There's even footage of Roosevelt taking the first airplane flight by a president in 1910, when he was invited for a flight by the plane's owner, Arch Hoxie. Interviewed after the flight, he said, You know, I didn't intend to do it, but when I saw the thing sitting there, I could not resist it. Always a larger-than-life character, he was also caricatured in animation. Roosevelt left office in 1909, but remained a popular subject for news cameramen, like during this visit to St. Paul in 1917. Roosevelt died in 1919, and filmmakers released a number of commemorative films, although they lacked the bombast of the films honoring McKinley's passing. Nevertheless, the films featured a number of scenes of Roosevelt's gravesite, and especially featured the many foreign dignitaries who came to visit, including Edward, Prince of Wales, who would later become King Edward VIII. We are also lucky enough to have a number of sound recordings of Roosevelt, primarily from his failed 1912 campaign as the candidate for the Bull Moose Party. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated briefly. It is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will, day in and day out, make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern them. I believe again that the American people are, as a whole, capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents pay lip loyalty to this doctrine, but they show their real belief by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. Roosevelt was succeeded by William Howard Taft. A less colorful man than Roosevelt, he remained a popular subject, if not quite as popular. One interesting fact about Taft was that he was the first president to play golf, a sport which has since gone on to become practically synonymous with the presidency.
Taft was followed by Woodrow Wilson, who led America into the First World War. As such, many of the films we have of Wilson are in that capacity. Declaring war, reviewing American troops, and inspecting equipment. But I find myself particularly drawn to this quiet moment, where Wilson watches sheep graze on the lawn of the White House. likely wasn't a striking moment to audiences at the time, but I for one am fascinated by how it highlights how much that August building has changed in a hundred years. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time picturing a herd of sheep anywhere near the modern White House, where this bucolic scene has given way to streets, sidewalks, and fences. Interestingly, Wilson is probably better known for watching movies than for appearing in them. On February the 18th, 1915, Wilson hosted the very first movie ever screened at the White House. Unfortunately, that movie was The Birth of a Nation, a vile and racist film that glorifies the Ku Klux Klan and is often erroneously presented as the first feature-length film ever made, when, in reality, it wasn't even the first American feature-length film. Wilson hosted the film as a favor to his friend, Thomas Dixon, who had written the novel which Birth of a Nation was based on. On several occasions, the film even quoted a book Wilson himself had written. It's hard to say exactly what Wilson thought of the film himself. He was certainly impressed by its spectacle, saying it was like writing history with lightning. And Wilson was himself a Southerner, who was openly critical of Reconstruction. He had, however, publicly rejected the Klan as un-American. Still, as the controversy began to swirl around the film, Wilson issued a statement saying that he had no knowledge of what the film was going to be about in advance, which, given his connection to Dixon, seems pretty unlikely. He also claimed that he had never said anything particularly positive about the movie. Surprisingly, he would openly endorse one other film, Thomas Ince's 1915 film, Civilization, which Wilson praised for its anti-war message. Wilson was succeeded by Warren G. Harding, seen here dedicating the new Lincoln Memorial in 1922. Calvin Coolidge followed in 1923 and possessed a reputation as quiet and reclusive, so much so that he was even nicknamed Silent Cal. It's ironic, then, that he was the first president to really make use of mass communication. His second inauguration was the very first broadcast on the radio, and he followed that on December the 6th, 1923, with the first presidential radio address. Silent Cal was even the first president to appear on sound film. The country needs every ounce of its energy to restore itself. The costs of government are all assessed upon the people. This means that the farmer is doomed to provide a certain amount of money out of the sale of his produce, no matter how low the price to pay his taxes. The manufacturer, the professional man, the clerk must do the same from their income. The wage earner, often at a higher rate when compared with his earning, makes his contribution, perhaps not directly, but indirectly in the advanced cost of everything he buys. The expenses of the government reach everybody. Taxes take from everyone a part of his earning and force everyone to work for a certain part of his time 
for the government. While sound films like The Jazz Singer were still years away, there were a number of experimental sound technologies available. One was called DeForest Phonofilms, developed by a man named Lee DeForest. The sound quality of these films was relatively poor, but DeForest still eagerly pursued big-name acts and newspapers for his movies in a bid to interest the big Hollywood studios. It's frankly astonishing that DeForest secured Coolidge's participation. Coolidge apparently only agreed to the film very reluctantly. He complained of the inconvenience, criticized the lighting, and read his words in a, quote, lifeless voice. He appeared, quote, cross and put out throughout the filming, and the moment he finished, he, quote, walked out of the picture. Still, Coolidge clearly understood the power of reaching out to the public in this way and appeared in a second DeForest Phono film when he presented the Congressional Medal of Honor to Charles Lindbergh. A conqueror of the air and strengthener of the ties which bind us to our sister nations across the sea. And as President of the United States, I bestow the Distinguished Flying Cross as a symbol of appreciation for what he is and what he has done upon Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh. The creation of Herbert Hoover in 1929 gave audiences the rare opportunity of seeing three presidents together on film. Hoover, the outgoing Calvin Coolidge, and William Howard Taft, now serving as Chief Justice of the United States. One other treasure from Hoover's time in the White House are these color home movies shot by Mrs. Hoover. The films date from 1928 and were filmed in Kodakolor, an early color film format. They show a softer side of a man often considered distant and rigid, including this footage of the president playing a game called Hoover Ball, a combination of tennis and volleyball designed by his doctors to help him control his weight. These films were only recently discovered at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, where they were initially thought to be black and white, and may be the earliest color footage of the White House and of a president. Hoover is also the subject of a rare early campaign film called The Master of Emergencies, which was commissioned by Hoover when he was Secretary of Commerce and running for president. As a member of Coolidge's cabinet, it was Hoover who first recognized the power of radio and film and encouraged Coolidge to open himself up to the media. Hoover recognized that those same tools could be powerful aids in his own bid for the White House. Made by Hoover's friend, writer Will Irwin, Master of Emergencies highlights Hoover's experience responding to mass flooding in the southern U.S. and managing food supplies during World War I. to reach as many voters as possible, Hoover hired a fleet of specially built trucks 
to carry the film across the country. Each truck was fitted with a special projection screen that extended from the rear, so the film could be shown anywhere, anytime. By the time Franklin Delano Roosevelt claimed the presidency in 1933, radio and films were commonplace, and the president's face and voice were as familiar to Americans as their favorite Hollywood stars. Like Coolidge and Hoover before him, FDR recognized just how special this connection with the American people could be, and how that sort of contact could help him further his goals. As governor of New York, Roosevelt had started making a series of radio addresses to his constituents, and carried on the tradition of these so-called fireside chats into the White House. He made the first a mere eight days after his inauguration. The Great Depression was still raging, and Americans were panicked by a sudden rash of bank closings. FDR took to the air to reassure an audience of 60 million Americans and to tell them about the creation of federal deposit insurance. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. This deeply personal plea to the American public worked, almost immediately restoring the faith of a shaken public. And within two weeks, people had returned more than half of the cash they were hoarding at home to American banks. The informal addresses stuck and helped FDR to relate to the common man, especially during the dark days of World War II. Yes, newsreels offered Americans regular views of the president in action, but the radio offered a more intimate connection that no doubt buoyed FDR's popularity. Thanks to the radio, the president was now in Americans' homes and, seemingly, speaking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Incidentally, the term fireside chants came from Roosevelt's press secretary, Stephen Early, who said that the president liked to picture his audience as a small group of people gathered around the fireside. Like FDR, Harry S. Truman would appear in various newsreels and even became the first TV president. To be completely honest, FDR actually appeared on television first, but that was at the 1939 New York World's Fair and could only be seen at the fairgrounds or at Radio City. But on October the 5th, 1947, Harry S. Truman gave the first nationally televised presidential speech. And on September the 4th, 1951, he headlined the very first coast-to-coast -coast TV broadcast of any kind. This is the first coast-to-coast -coast television broadcast in history. This first transcontinental television broadcast, originating at the Opera House in San Francisco, will bring you the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, addressing the welcoming ceremony of the Japanese Peace Conference. I'm glad to welcome you to this conference for the signing of the Treaty of Peace with Japan. The people of the United States are honored to serve as hosts to this meeting. In actuality, most Americans listened to this speech over the radio, as only a few thousand owned televisions. Still, the potential for the medium, which combined the power of film with the intimacy of radio, was unmistakable and every speech Truman made thereafter was broadcast on television. Truman continued to appear on television regularly throughout the rest of his life, even long after he'd left the presidency. In 1959, he became the first president to appear on a sitcom with his appearance on The Jack Benny Show. And in 1964, he hosted a series called Decision, The Conflicts of Harry S. Truman, which offered a retrospective of his years in office. Sir, at the time that you first found out about the atomic bomb, did you regard it as a curse or a blessing to mankind? 
what I thought was a blessing. I thought it could be used and made a blessing. I never worried about its being a curse. I wanted a weapon that would win the war, and it did. That's what I was interested in. Dwight D. Eisenhower, too, made numerous television appearances, appealing to an increasingly wide audience. In 1949, just 172,000 TV sets had been sold in America. But by 1953, during Eisenhower's presidency, that number had swelled to 52 million. Eisenhower embraced television early on, hiring actor Robert Montgomery as his television advisor and utilizing an extensive television ad campaign during his 1952 bid for the presidency. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. As president, Ike used the medium to broadcast regular White House news conferences and for a series of televised fireside chats. Television was now able to offer wide swaths of Americans immediate access to their president, something that was absolutely unthinkable just a hundred years before. Still, film was not yet done with the presidency. The 1960 documentary Primary employed new filmmaking technology, including mobile cameras and lightweight sound equipment, to offer an unprecedented up-close look at the Democratic primary between John F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. Produced by Robert Drew, directed by D.A. Pennebaker, and shot by Richard Leacock and Albert Mazels, the movie offered a revolutionary, almost point-of-view look at the campaign, entering homes and hotel rooms and weaving in and out of crowds alongside the cameras. The film was highly influential, both as a look at the road to the presidency and as a documentary itself, helping to move the genre from the state affairs it had once been to the more freewheeling kinetic format we now know. Still, television would offer the defining moment of the 1960 presidential race, with one of the great moments of early television. On September 26th, the CBS studio in Chicago hosted the first televised presidential debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. The debate was simultaneously broadcast on the radio, as many Americans still did not own televisions. Those who tuned in on TV, though, witnessed a true watershed moment. If you feel that everything that is being done now is satisfactory, that the relative power and prestige and strength of the United States is increasing in relation to that of the communists, that we are gaining more security, that we are achieving everything as a nation that we should achieve, that we're achieving a better life for our citizens and greater strength, then I agree. I think you should vote for Mr. Nixon. But if you feel that we have to move again in the 60s, that the function of the president is to set before the people the unfinished business of our society, as Franklin Roosevelt did in the 30s, the agenda for our people, what we must do as a society to meet our needs in this country and protect our security and help the cause of freedom. As I said at the beginning, the question before us all, that faces all Republicans and all Democrats, is can freedom in the next generation conquer or are the communists going to be successful? 
That's the great issue. And if we meet our responsibilities, I think freedom will conquer. If we fail, if we fail to move ahead, if we fail to develop sufficient military and economic and social strength here in this country, then I think that uh, the tide could begin to run against us. And I don't want historians 10 years from now to say, these were the years when the tide ran out for the United States. I want them to say, these were the years when the tide came in. These were the years when the United States started to move again. That's the question before the American people, and only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. I think we're ready to move. And it is to that great task, if we're successful, that we will address ourselves. Kennedy was hale, healthy, and tan, having spent the entire weekend holed up in a nearby hotel, preparing for the debate. He looked great on camera, and instinctively knew to look directly into the lens, so it looked like he was making eye contact with the viewers at home. Nixon had only recently recovered from the flu and was still running a temperature. Worse yet, he banged his knee on the way into the studio, exacerbating an injury from a few weeks before. He looked sweaty and exhausted on screen and continuously focused his attention on the off-screen debate moderators, giving the unintentional impression that he was unwilling to meet the gaze of the viewers at home. The anecdotal evidence from after the debate is staggering. Those who listened on the radio called the debate a draw or gave the edge to Nixon. Those who watched on television called Kennedy the winner by a healthy margin. Kennedy may not have been the first TV president, but he was the first who seemed tailor-made for the medium. Young, handsome, and energetic, the camera loved him, and audiences loved seeing him. Tragically, one of the other defining television moments of Kennedy's career echoed those long-ago films of McKinley and the Temple of Music. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Everyone who was alive that day remembers where they were when they heard the news, and many heard it from that very broadcast. News of McKinley's assassination had taken days to reach some Americans, with the footage coming only weeks later. But television united the nation in tragedy, forever preserving that horrible moment in an amber of video. Television is now the way most Americans engage with their president. We are used to seeing regular updates in press conferences and breaking news items. Events like the State of the Union or a national address seem like commonplace fixtures. The president has changed from a distant, mysterious figure to a fellow American, one who we can hear with our own ears and see with our own eyes. I want to thank you for joining me tonight for this look at the history of the presidency on film. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have enjoyed it, Please comment on this video, like this video, and subscribe to the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel. Or send me an email at eric at northmetrotv.com to let me know what you think. Your comments and emails and likes all help to be able to keep us to keep doing these videos, which is especially important right now while the COVID-19 pandemic continues to keep us from being able to come together in large groups to enjoy these classes live and in person. I also want to thank you if you're tuning in and watching this video on North Metro TV channel 14. This is only one of a number of class that, classes that we've been holding over the course of the pandemic. You can find more classes just like this one at the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel, which you can find either by searching Movie Man Eric at YouTube or by going to MovieManEric.com where you will find a link to watch more of these videos. We have videos about Marilyn Monroe and the Marx Brothers, about Hollywood during World War II, about the history of game shows, even about Hollywood's most famous dogs. And I hope that you'll come by and you'll watch and you'll enjoy those classes. Until then, I've been Movie Man Eric Houston. Thank you again for watching. Please have a wonderful night and please stay safe. A great congressman was running for re-election. And he told a story about a fellow who had, uh, for the first time, been in New York. And uh, 
he was having dinner at one of these great restaurants and they brought him a bunch of celery and he ate it. They brought him some consomme and he drank that and then they brought him a lobster on the plate. And he said, now listen, I ate your bouquet, I drank your dishwater, but damned if I'm gonna eat that bug and he wouldn't eat the, the, the lobster and I don't blame him, I wouldn't either. <laughs>